Again, my name is Rick Mercier. Some of you already know me. Uh, for those who don't, I've been providing bees here at this orchard for a number of years. And um, it's been real fun to be coming out here a couple times a year. That's about all I ever get out here, so living on the other side of the water. Anyway, um, before we start talking about mason bees in particular, I want to tell you a little bit about bees in general. So if you guys think of a question, please, if you get a chance, just write it down. We'll have plenty of time to uh, talk, go over questions and stuff like that at the end of this brief presentation. And uh, I'll be more than happy to answer everyone's questions. On this planet, we have 20,000 bee species. In fact, two thirds of the world crops rely on pollinators for production. In fact, one out of every three bites of food that we consume are made available to us by bees. Um, here in the United States, we have 4,000 native bee species. And one of these brochures I handed uh, out uh, a few minutes ago tells you a little bit about that. Um, USDA did a study of those 4,000 native bees and half are in decline. The remaining half are either already extinct or on the verge of extinction. Now, when I read that uh, information a number of years ago, that was pretty troubling to me. And there's a lot of blame to go around. Loss of habitat, urban sprawl, um, pesticides and fungicides, and predators. We'll talk about predators at the end of this, and we'll address that then. Um, loss of habitat. One thing all of us can do to help uh, feed these beneficial pollinators is to provide or plant uh, pollinator-friendly plants, plants on our properties. That helps tremendously, okay? Um, a little bit about pesticides and stuff like that. Pesticides and insecticides are just that. They're insect killers, okay? Herbicides, not a lot different than fungicides, but fungicides I want to touch on a little bit. Fungicides, some fungicides have active insecticides in them. It's the ones that don't that are very problematic I really want to bring your attention to. Because on the labels of these products, it'll say non-toxic to bees, right? And while that may be true outright, you can't believe everything these chemical companies are telling you. Um, some of these products have chemicals in them that attack the bees neurologically. It confuses them. They forget to eat, they forget to breed, and they forget where they live. I saw this devastation a few years ago firsthand. It's an absolutely horrible thing to witness. Okay. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to stand up here and tell people, tell you folks that not to use these products if you need them. I'm sure there's time and a place that some of the stuff you need, right? Um, but the one thing I want to encourage everyone is to never apply these products when plants are blooming. Plants bloom for one reason, one reason only, and that's to attract pollinators for production. So don't use this stuff at that time uh, when plants are blooming. Now, you know, I got an idea. Let's throw a question out. Is, can anybody... Who, who do you think might be the leading country of producing of apples on this planet? What country do you think that might be? Anybody? Got any guesses? I'm sorry? Close. Hi, Jeannie. <laughs> I didn't see you sitting over there. Yeah, Canada's a great guess as well. Any more? Who said China. China's right. I heard that we exported our uh, apple juice concentrate industry to China. No, that doesn't surprise me. We've exported a lot of things to China. 
Let's, we'll not go there. We'll be here all day. If you look at the scale of apple producing countries, it kind of goes like this. Right? And at the end, it goes way up here like this and then back down. That's China. China, by far, is the leading producer of apples on this planet. It wasn't too many years ago that China used people to pollinate their apple crops because they had killed all their bees off. They're all gone. It's a good thing China's got a lot of people. They'd use ladders and they had a stick, I don't remember what it's called, and on this little stick had a piece of material and they'd go flower to flower to flower to pollinate all these apple blossoms. Can you imagine? Um, wasn't too many years ago, Chinese government brought bees back to the country um, to help with their pollination efforts. Um, and we'll see how long that lasts before they kill all those off. Um, so there's, there's that, anyhow. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about mason bees. You know, when I talk to people, there's always two things that come up when I tell them I raise bees. It's, uh, do you wear a suit? And, oh, I love honey, right? We all love honey, right? And uh, I tell them, it's like, no, I rarely wear a suit. I never wear a bee suit. And um, 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 when I tell them I raise orchard mason bees and that my bees don't make honey, I always prompts the next question. If your bees don't make honey, then why do you raise them? Right? And the answer is simple. I raise orchard mason bees to increase the crop yield of my plants I'm trying to pollinate. A study, or, a study of a cherry orchard in Utah a number of years ago was conducted and for almost 10 years, and they used honeybees for the first half of that study uh, to pollinate the orchards, and, uh, and then every year they measured the pounds of yield of cherries at that orchard. They were averaging around 10,000 pounds of yield. They removed the honeybees and brought in orchard mason bees for the second half of the study. And then measured the pounds of yield of cherries. They went from an average of 10,000 pounds of yield to over 35,000 pounds of yield. That's how efficient these bees are at pollinating. They're also great for your nuts and a lot of your early blooming berries. Okay. Um, now, unlike honeybees that were brought to this country from Europe, orchard mason bees are actually native to the United States. In fact, there's 130 variety of orchard mason bees in North America. In the United States, the blue orchard mason bee is the most common. That happens to be the bee I raise. Um, in addition to that, unlike a honeybee, Mason bees are totally non-aggressive. They simply don't sting and don't bite. You would literally have to grab a female orchard mason bee in your hand and squeeze her in order to entice her to sting you. And then in reality, more likely, she'd probably bite you instead of uh, stinging you because her stinger doesn't have any pop. Um, it's often referred to uh, like a mosquito bite and the venom is of such low toxicity that it can't, simply can't produce anaphylactic shock. You could literally take one of these bee houses in the orchard, fully active, bees flying, grab it, rip it down, throw it on the ground, kick it across your orchard, and not one of those bees will sting you. I don't suggest you try that with a honey beehive. <laughs> Probably ruin your day. Now, I haven't seen the scientific data, but I've read it takes 1,600 honeybees to do the work of one orchard mason bee. I got invited to do a talk at the Science and Math Institute School in Tacoma, Sammy, um, a bunch of years ago, and uh, I had some honeybee thing going on. The honeybee guy was there, and after he talked, I talked, and afterwards he was there, and I, I didn't know, so I asked him, I said, how many honeybees you put on a Werenacre orchard? And he said, at least 180,000. He must have been shocked by the expression on my face because he asked me, he said, how many mason bees do you put on a one-acre orchard? And I told him, 1,000. 
That's the difference. It basically takes 180,000 honeybees to do the work of 1,000 orchard mason bees. That's how efficient a pollinator they are. <clears throat> now, um, these bees are placed outside in the spring, usually anywhere from the 1st of March to the middle of April, sometime in that 45-day window, whatever, depending on what you're trying to pollinate and depending on the weather. Um, preferably, we like to place them on the bee houses. They don't go on the ground. We like to place them on a wall, preferably, if that's available, a shed, a barn, an outbuilding of some kind, um, a garage, a house, whatever it might be, facing east or facing south. And the orchard, obviously, we're using the fence posts out here. Um, if you were going to place them um, where they're not protected from the weather, you're simply going to have to waterproof uh, the bee house to keep the bees from getting wet and your house from wet. So um, if you can use a wall, great, preferably facing east or facing south. Uh, the bees need that morning sun to wake them up out of hibernation and get them flying and keep them flying in the morning. It kind of gets them going after they hibernate. Um, and they sleep at the bee house, so when the sun comes up, warms them up, and they get flying in the morning. So we need that uh, morning sun. Um, I prefer a south facing. Now in the orchard, it doesn't really matter because they're in the sun regardless of how they're faced. Um, the bee house is still in the sun, it warms up. But if it's on a wall, um, I like the south. And the reason for that is because we're so far north, the sun's in our southern sky, and you know how it is with fog and, and clouds, morning fog and clouds around here. Um, if we have that for a few hours in the morning, sun comes up and goes around, all that stuff burns off, it's on a south or an east facing wall, that house would be in the shade the rest of the day. So I prefer south, east works, I prefer the south. Um, so bees are out. Um, these bees have an uncanny ability to, um, to hatch at the appropriate time. Um, it's, all about, it's all about temperature. Your plants are blooming, it's all about temperature. Temperature and time of year and that kind of stuff. You know, we play Mother Nature's game here. Most of the time we win. Eh, occasionally we don't do quite as well as we'd like. Because timing isn't just right, for whatever reason. <clears throat> so, we put the bees out. We actually got them out here early on the island last year. And we had one of the best years last year on this island for bee production than, than all the years I've been out here. Um, we just, we had an incredible spring, an incredible uh, summer with temperature and stars aligned. We did very well. Um, so the bees are in their bee house in early spring. Males hatch first. Males are easy to see. They're easy to take pictures of because they're just hanging around a bee house, waiting for the girls to show up. <laughs> the females will hatch usually within about a week after the males. And uh, as soon as the females hatch, they immediately mate with the males. The males will immediately mount them. Um, I'll tell you real quick about that. Um, you want to be aware of this period going on. If you walk a lot in front of your bee house, wherever your bee house might be, or if you happen to be, have to mow through there, be aware when the bees are mating. You don't want to be stepping on them or mowing them up in the mower uh, at that time. I know because when I first started doing this, I used to have my bee house on my patio, on the wall of my house, an external wall. And every Easter, I've got a house full of people and little kids running all over the place. And my bees were on the patio uh, breeding, and I had to line chairs up around in front of them to keep kids and people from stepping on them. So um, be aware of that. Okay, the bees hatch, they mate, and the females fly off and begin their egg laying and pollinating duties, right? <clears throat> She'll fly out, fly out to the wherever she's collecting this pollen and this nectar, 
and she will fly back to the bee house, select a nesting chamber, and start removing all that pollen off of her body. Um, and then she'll regurgitate a little of that nectar and make a, make a, make a nest inside that nesting chamber. I refer to it kind of like a little catcher's glove, right? So when she, when she gets all this stuff off and, and makes this nest kind of like a little catcher's glove, when she's satisfied with that, she'll crawl out, turn around, back in, and deposit an egg right in the center of that nest. When she's satisfied, she'll crawl back out, fly away, find an adequate mud source, collect it in her mandibles, in her mouth, fly back to the bee house, crawl in the nesting chamber, and make a mud wall in front of that nest. Hence the word mason bee, okay? And she'll seal that chamber off. Then she'll fly out, collect pollen and nectar, come back, build another nest, lay another egg, collect mud, and close it off again, so on, so on, so on, throughout the nesting chamber. She'll usually use one, two, maybe sometimes three nesting chambers um, made available to her. Um, as she's laying her eggs, she lays all the females in the back. I'll just use this as an example. That's the front. She'll lay all the females in the back and all the males in the front. Why does she do that? One, because the males hatch first. They're unimpeded by the females. They crawl out and wait for the females. The second reason she does that is to protect the females in the back in the event of any predatory invasion in the front. Can't get to them in the back. It's usually sealed off one way or another. And so the, the front's the, the available side for predators. So she does that to protect the females in the back. So in essence, She's willing to sacrifice the female, the males in the front to protect the females in the back. Come on, ladies, chuckle. The ladies always like that one, right? <laughs> work, <coughs> work with me here. <laughs> um, so she does. Now, how is she able to do that, right? After mating with the males, she stored that material in a special organ in her body called a spermatica. Where did I learn all this stuff? I'd like to read. <laughs> um, so she stored that material in there. And so and then every time she lays an egg, if she wants it to be a female, she makes a transfer of that material, and that egg's destined to become a female. If she wants that egg to become a male, she doesn't do that, and that egg is destined to become a male, which kind of leads to another thing we won't really touch on it too much, is why you have to ensure that you have enough males to go around so that the females are bred. Okay, if she, don't, if, she, if she doesn't mate, she's gonna lay a chamber full of males because she doesn't have that material, okay? Um, now, like all, almost all bees, mason bees are no different. They're very short-lived. People don't realize how short of a lifespan most bees have. Mason bees are no different than honeybees when it comes to this regard. They only live about six or eight weeks. Difference is, is that a honeybee, a mason bee lays eggs once a year. In her short lifespan, she will lay up to about 30 eggs. A queen honeybee, for example, she is able to live for a number of years, and she will lay anywhere from 500 to 2,000 eggs a day. That's the difference. That's why you see them all summer and they're available for all these uh, other, other things and stuff. So uh, mason bees aren't quite like that. Now if anybody raises honeybees and I said anything that I missed, please feel free to correct me in a few minutes when I'm done. Um, so um, the eggs are laid, females die, males are already done. They've done what they needed to do. And um, um, females pa pass on and then, uh, then those eggs start hatching. Eggs hatch. That pupa now consumes that nest that it was laid in. That's its food stash. Once it's consumed all that material, 
it will slowly start spinning a cocoon around itself and, um, and then develop into a bee inside of that cocoon. Um, now, all of this takes place during the warm uh, days and temperatures during the summer. And by the, usually by the middle of September, 1st of October, these bees are fully developed inside of a cocoon. They go into hibernation during the winter um, and await spring and the process starts all over again. Now, um, there's a couple things about raising these bees you, you want to be aware of to be successful. And I'll tell you about this real quick and we'll talk about pests for a minute and then I'll open this up to questions and thank you for your patience. Um, um, being successful to raise these bees. Basically, their industry standard um, uses three types of nesting material. One are these great uh, tubes, have a paper liner inside of it, has a black plug on the end. It's a Knox Sellers product. They're out of Bremerton, I believe. Uh, this company just sold, uh, a new gal owns it, real nice guy, I just talked to her the other day. Um, I always have some to make available for folks. I can charge, you know, I charge them, or charge the same price she does, and I sell them in smaller bunches than she does, so you don't have to buy a whole box if people like this stuff. These are great. This, when I first started, this is what I used, okay? Um, another is a laminate, wood laminate. Now this one's sealed, this one's brand new. Um, at the end of the season, you gotta cut these bands off, and then the rubber bands are the replacements for these. And then you just take these things and you just open them up. And then inside all these nesting chambers, you can just, um, all your bee cocoons will be in there. And the third is a natural reed. These look like bamboo. They're closed off on one end, open on the other, but they're not. They're actually a they're actually a grass. Invasive. But in the country, they harvest them for this purpose, and uh, they work very well. Once they're harvested, they they can't spread, so there's no big deal about that. So, but they are an invasive uh, stem type grass. Right, they cut them at the right length. These are great because like these, you can open these up. You can remove the paper liner from here to get to your bee cocoons. Uh, bamboo is extremely hard. People call me every year. How do I get these things open? Very difficult. These are really easy. You just grab the front and squeeze it. Splits down two sides. You peel it open to get your bee cocoons. Um, so... Um, providing a clean nesting environment, like I said, is one of the keys of raising these things. Um, these you can clean. These you have to replace, obviously, after you bust them open. And this one you just put in a new paper liner every year. Okay? Um, I probably should have done this earlier. I did bring some bees, and we'll, we'll get back to what I'm talking about here in a second. These are some dead bees I found in the nesting chambers when I was harvesting. If you look closely, I think there's three females in here and three males. The males are a little smaller than the females. Um, one thing you might notice about the males also here, I'll just start passing these around if you want to look. The males have a little white tuft of fur on their face, kind of like a beard, right? Um, females don't. Their antennae is about, I don't know if you'll be able to see that there, you might be able to is about a third, again, longer than the female. That's really about the only way to be able to tell them apart. Um, clean nesting environment for them. Um, another is mud. We talked about mud briefly. They'll fly out, collect mud, build that, build that wall, and seal off that chamber, right? Um, <laughs> there are people in the industry that'd be happy to sell you mud. In the Pacific Northwest in the springtime, mud's not n n normally not an issue for us, right? We normally have all the mud we need. If we have an extremely dry spring, we had one a few years ago. I even did this at my house. 
Um, I was worried the bees may not be able to find the mud they needed, so I just dug a shallow depression near my bee house, lined it with plastic, threw some compost in there, and kept it wet. Bees were happy to use it. Or you can buy mud. Um, let's see. Um, so the other, the other thing is to protect them during the summer while they're developing from predators. Remember I said we talk about predators. What are predators? There's a number of different predators for these docile bees. Um, birds can be one. Um, I can tell you a story about a stellar jay. You may not want to hear it. Um, in my yard one day. Um, he flew away, but he wasn't real happy. Um, so um, birds will take advantage of your, your bees. Um, I always encourage people never to put out feeders when you're raising these bees. If you want to put feeders out, wait till the bees are done, then put feeders out, okay? I have a hummingbird feeder myself. I know they will feed on small insects. I haven't really seen them bothering my bees. I haven't worried about them too much. Um, birds, what, what are the predators? One here at this orchard is quite prolific, and that is earwigs. I've never seen as many earwigs as this orchard's got here. This orchard is infected with earwigs. I don't know why. Um, you might see, if you've ever been out there and looked, under the, on the post underneath these bee houses is a plastic bottle. It's been taped. It's got black tape around it, and it's taped to the post to keep it there so it doesn't blow away or whatever. Inside of that's a special product to attack that issue because the, they're that bad here. This is the only place I have to do that. Those are, those are my bottles under those bee houses. <laughs> and, and it's a special product. Yes, ma'am. I, I don't know what it is. Um, everybody's got earwigs. I've just never seen them as bad as I've seen them in this orchard here. Um, so I don't know what's creating that problem, um, but you have a ton of them. First time I put bees here and I came back to harvest the bees, I was shocked. I mean, I grabbed the, the nesting chambers out of the bee houses. I mean, you got hundreds of earwigs falling off of these things, off of every one of them. Inside the bee house, full of them. Terrible. Anyway, so I'm sure earwigs have a, a, have a purpose, but they like to eat your bee stuff. Yes, ma'am. What is it? Um, I, I didn't bring any pictures. You know, I don't do PowerPoints because a lot of times these talks take so long as it is. But an earwig is just a small insect that basically lives in the ground and on trees and stuff. It's got pinchers on the back. You ever seen them little pincher bugs? No? You'll, you'll know it when you see one. Yeah, look like little, look like little dinosaurs. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, so what are your predators? You got pinch, pinch, no, I'm saying it, earwigs. Birds and earwigs, spiders, ants, certain kinds of beetles, um, and other stuff that will take advantage of these nests with these eggs and all this great pollen source in there and or the pupas at that stage if some, if these insects can get at them. Even, even moths, um, a certain moth, Takes, it will take advantage of them as well. Um, three more I'll tell you about real quick and we'll open this up to, to questions. Another one is a native um, <clears throat> here in the Pacific Northwest because of our very damp climate, um, it's called a pollen mite. Where they go in the winter, I have no idea. Um, but in the spring when these, when these Fruit trees in particular, now these bees are native to our environment. They'll feed on a wide variety of spring flowering plants at, that are blooming, right? Uh, clover, dandelions, the big leaf maples with their huge pendulums of flowers. They love those things, right? And a lot of other stuff, um, and a lot of stuff that you have in your flower beds and that kind of stuff, they love it. Flowering current, bees loving things. Um, but, <clears throat> so these, Pollen mites are in the flowers, 
They're microscopic by, for all intents and purposes. I don't know that you could see one individually. Um, unlike the Varoma mite for some of the honeybee folks, um, you can see them on the bees. Um, if too many pollen mites get in a nesting chamber, doesn't happen all the time, but it happens. If too many get in there, they reproduce so fast that they will consume everything inside that nesting chamber, and that bee's done. Okay, so pollen mites is one. <clears throat> the last two I want to tell you about, both invasive, both come from Europe, and they're in a classification known as kleptoparasitic. One is a mono wasp, very small, about the size of a large gnat. That's how small it is. Very um, problematic for these bees. They were actually brought to this country 150 years ago, whatever it was, to combat a beetle infestation in the Carolinas. Now they're everywhere. Okay, they're very small. They have no positor like a stinger. The females roll it up underneath their abdomen, and then when she wants to use it, she rolls this thing out. And with that big opositor, she tries to penetrate these nesting chambers, and then she'll deposit her eggs in there, and then those eggs will hatch, and then they'll consume anything inside that nesting chamber. Okay? Uh, Monowasp. The last one is a fly. It's about an eighth of an inch long. Again, very small. They're very easy to distinguish. They have these bright, glowing red eyes. You'll see them on your bee house. They'll be hanging out. They're just hanging out. You'll just see them sitting up there. And they're, they're easy to kill if you can catch them because they're slow flying. So if you see one and it flies off the bee house, you probably just kind of lumber away and if you get lucky. Right? You can get them like that. Um, sometimes I even do it at my own house. Um, I have a shake house, so unfortunately it's hard for me to control some of these insects because I can control them at the bee house, but I can't control the ones that are nesting in the shake of my house, unfortunately. So that's a problem for me. So I've got this little handheld vacuum that when I go out to the bee house, I take my little vacuum out there, mine's on a, it's a rechargeable thing, and, and I turn it on, I see them, and I just turn it on and suck them up and kill them that way. But it works really well. Um, so what happens is with the Houdini fly, is they hang around the bee house, and they have, I guess it's nature, right? Um, they haven't been here for a long time. They're kind of new. They've only been here for a few years, but they've, um, they're have they really starting to make their presence known, and we're really having to combat them. And I'm telling you about some of this stuff, like the Houdini fly and the mono wasps. Here at the island, um, you don't have much Houdini flies. You have a little mono, not too much for the Houdini fly, I don't think. You might have some, but not in great numbers. So not every place has all these problems. Different places have different issues. Um, some are lucky and have all of them. Um, so, but the, the Houdini fly, they just hang around the bee house and they watch those females. And they know that when that female backs in, when she crawls out, turns around and backs in, they know she's going in there to lay an egg. And then when she crawls out and flies away, Houdini fly attacks. It goes inside that nesting chamber, deposits its own eggs in there. When the female comes back with the mud to seal it off, they're very small, she doesn't, she doesn't catch it. And uh, she muds that chamber off and she seals them, seals her own. Uh, um, eggs fate inside there. Those will hatch. Uh, those maggots will consume everything inside that nesting chamber and lay there all summer and hibernate through the winter and hatch in the spring and attack your bees again. And so harvesting, providing this clean nesting environment for them every year and by harvesting your bees um, you can help eliminate all of this kind of stuff, at least keep it in check. 
It's the people, unfortunately, um, who do not take the time to do this are creating problems for all of us. Now, I did bring some brochures. I didn't pass them out. They're right up there. Feel free to grab one if you want. Um, if, you're, if you are interested in these bees and think you might want to put these bees on your properties, um, um, but you're squeamish about the insect side of it and don't want to deal with the harvesting and the work and all that that it takes, and it's not much, it's actually kind of fun to do, unless you're raising 150,000 of them like I am, and it becomes work. <laughs> but it's pretty easy to do, it's fun, you can get the kids involved and all that kind of stuff. Um, but if you don't want to do that, I would. but you still want the benefit of the bees, consider renting, renting them. There's a company up in Woodenville, Bothell area up there, be happy to rent you these insects. And then you just mail them back to them every uh, late September, early October, and then in the spring, they'll mail you back more for a small fee. That's kind of it. Jerry, yes? Tell them what you do when you're borrowing I mean, that's fascinating. <laughs> sure. Um, now, it's all the buzz. I treat this like a company. I have to, right? But it's really more hobby for me than company. I enjoy doing what I do. Um, um, I enjoy teaching people about the benefit of these amazing pollinators and all that. So, um, but I do, um, um, I have a website. It's called itsallthebuzz.com. I have a Facebook page too. It's called It's All The Buzz. I should have handed some of these out. Here. Here's some cards. It's all a buzz. I love it's all a buzz. You know, we went down to, went on a trip, and I'll get back to that, Jerry, in just a second. <clears throat> went on a trip a few years ago, and um, I started selling some of my bees because I had so many to a couple of nurseries, and nursery down in Northern California I was providing bees for, and, and, uh, and on the way back, my wife and I were talking about it, and I told her, I said, you know, we should really think of a name for this hobby of mine, right? <laughs> so on the way back, all the way back, we're driving, trying to figure out a name. It's like, we couldn't come up with that. My wife came up with, be a pollinator. Well, I'm not stupid. I got that on my card, but I didn't, I didn't use that as a name, right? <laughs> but um, so... <clears throat> We got back, we're contemplating this. One of our grandsons was home from college and, and I told him about it and he's like, how about it's all the buzz? Like, not you kids or something else, I tell you. So it's all the buzz. Anyway, so I have a Facebook page, it's all a buzz. I have a website called itsallabuzz.com. If you go to the website, be sure and add the .com or it'll go to every marijuana site in the country. They love the name, okay? I own it, they love it. Um, so anyway, on my website, in the blog, I have three videos. It takes you A to Z on harvesting your bees, okay? If anybody's really fascinated and really bored in their life and want to see how this is done, you're welcome to my garage anytime after the 1st of October. I'll, yeah, next year. I'll be in my garage from the 1st of October till Christmas, harvesting bees, okay? Um, we extract them. <clears throat> I use primarily laminates because I grow so many bees. I started doing this, um, opening all these paper liners, and I'll show you how it's done kind of in a second. Um, I do use these as well. Um, part of what I do is I provide bees for a number of local orchards at no cost to help with their production. I gotta tell you right now I'm maxed out, so I'm not taking on any more. I just can't do any more than I already do. Um, and then I do sell a few um, to help pay for my hobby so my hobby doesn't cost me money, right? My website's expensive enough. Um, anyway. So we extract um, the bees from these chambers and then like, like for the laminate, for example, we open this up 
and we know all the females are in the back and all the males are in the front. And I use a 5 16 wood dowel, sharpened at a 45 degree angle, and I just lay it in here and just kind of pop them out like popcorn. You know? And I put all the females in one tray and all the males in another. And I do every location individually. Like this orchard would be done, um, this place would be done by itself, they're all kept separate. That way, if I put a thousand bees somewhere and I harvest it and I go through the whole process and I count them up at the end, and believe it or not, I count every bee I raise. It takes a long time. Five at a time. Anyway. Um, so, and we count them. If I put a thousand bees somewhere and I harvest them and I only get 500 back, I'm doing something. Something's wrong. I got to figure out what's happening, right? Uh, if I put a thousand bees somewhere and I count them and I get 3,000 back, I'm happy about that, okay? One reason we grow them in a lot of different locations is because not everybody is as successful every year as everybody else. So while some places may not do very well, other places might, and um, it kind of makes up the difference. So we extract them, we sex them at that time. Females in one tray, males in another. After that's done, we wash them. I say we. Here's we. <laughs> we is one letter. It's I. <laughs> I wash them. So I wash them in a 5% bleach solution with water. One thing I did mention is there is a fungal, one fungal issue is called chalk brood. Um, we manage it very well with that bleach uh, water. Um, so it's really not much of a problem. You could develop a huge chalk boot problem if you didn't do that um, for yourself, but we do that. So rent, we wash them in that bleach water for just about a minute. We swish them around in there. We dump them in a colander, rinse them with real cold water. Um, it does a couple things. It gets the bleach off of them, and it also helps remove any pollen mites that might still be on them as well that we can't see, okay? So we wash all that stuff down the sink. We take the cocoons at that time, they're laid out on, on a big screen, and we put a fan on them, and uh, we dry them. The bee cocoons are watertight. They're like little bobbers. They float. As a matter of fact, I, I had put some, I won't get into all of it, but. I had put some in another container that had water in it. I had forgot about it. Um, there weren't supposed to be any cocoons in there. There were some predators I put in there. I was trying to drown them. Um, I don't even do that anymore. I just kill them with fire. <laughs> hate to say it, but they got to go somehow. Um, so, and I, had, I didn't know there were any cocoons in there. A couple weeks later, I go in there and there's a couple cocoons floating. So, <laughs> wow. I scooped them up, put them in a different container, put them in the fridge, and put them out in the spring in their own container. Every one of them hatched. I was pretty surprised. Um, so that was a test. Uh, um, so they're, they're, they're sexed, they're washed, they're dried, and once they're dried, I put them in refrigerators. They're kept in refrigerators at about 37 degrees about 70% humidity during the winter. It keeps them at a steady hibernated state. Like in the wild, you know, the temperatures warm up like we had last week. Bees wake up, they think it's time to wake up and go to work. Gets cold like it did again this morning. Bees go back into hibernation. So in the wild, this roller coaster ride is not good for them. Um, but keep them at that steady temperature, steady humidity. Um, we ensure a high survival rate. I think my survival rate's probably close to probably 98%. Okay. Now, one of the things I didn't mention, and I'm glad Jerry brought this up, <clears throat> after we dry them on the screen, one thing we also do uh, before we count them is I candle them. I candle them with an LED light. So I've got a couple thousand, couple thousand bees out on this screen, and I use a 
LED light and I go underneath this screen and I look at these cocoons. You can see all this stuff in my videos. And, <clears throat> and I'm checking these cocoons for, for any issues. Uh, so I wanna make sure there's a viable bee inside of that cocoon. If it doesn't look right, or if I can't, you know, if, if something's off, I'll take it out, put it in another container. If I know it's bad, it goes into a tray that's bad, and we deal with that. If I'm not sure about it, if something doesn't look right, I'll put it in another tray, and then I'll window that cocoon individually. And I've got a special little LED light I use to do that. It's kind of amazing. You can see it in my video. I could probably show one to you on my phone real quick. Of, uh, of the mason bee inside the cocoon. You know, it's like you did when you were kids when you are in school, right? And you candle an egg or something. Same process. You're just doing it uh, with a cocoon. And then they're stored in the refrigerator, and then we bring them out, we count them, and then they go out to the orchards. Thanks, Jerry. That was a long answer, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Well, that's a great question. Um, a lot of people try, will try to, or I shouldn't say a lot of people, some people will get a bee house, get one of these nesting materials. Now, when I first started years ago, you go to these garden shows and the people would say these four by four blocks with holes drilled in them. We don't use those anymore. One, the holes are very shallow. You don't get very many cocoons in it. And two, it's impossible to clean and harvest your bees. It's just a a hotel for um, for breeding predatory insects in a short amount of time. So we don't do that anymore. We use this stuff. <clears throat> so um, people will buy a bee house with nesting material in it or whatever, and they'll put it on their property and try to catch wild bees. That's great. Good luck. You might do it. It might work. Most people are not successful with that process, um, but it's happened. I took over a big uh, Charlotte's Blueberry Park in Tacoma. I'm the beekeeper there. Um, they had a big urban group try to do that. They were unsuccessful. They called me, and so I'm the pollinator. I'm the beekeeper there these days. But um, it, it can happen. But if, if you're unsuccessful or if you just want to ensure that you have bees, let somebody like me know. We'll be happy to sell you some. Okay? I've got bees for sale. I brought some today. Right here. I'll show you some actually real quick. It's how I, like I said before, it's how I pay for my hobby, so my hobby, hobby doesn't cost me money. I'll pass this around real quick and then we'll um, get these back in here because this, uh, uh, this is cool. No, they're in cocoon form, they're in hibernation. There's, there's 10 in a box. There's four females and six males. The proper ratio for breeding purposes is one and a half males for every female. So for every 10 bees, you, you got four male, or four females and six males. So um, like I said, we're happy to, I'm happy to sell you some to help pay for my time and efforts. And then what do you do with them? Oh, I'm sorry. I have sorry. no idea. I'm sorry. <laughs> So um, there's a number of things. There's a lot of people out there that sell bee houses, a lot of different groups that do it. Um, I actually came up, it took me about 10 years to develop, <clears throat> excuse me, a really neat couple bee houses, but I don't make them anymore simply because they take up too much of my time. And I was trying to find somebody uh, that was interested in building these um, for a reasonable price so that we could market these things and uh, couldn't find anybody so um, I quit building them because they take up so much of my time um, but you never know where that will go one day um, however after looking at what these things cost and um, the houses, I, the houses I created had their own built-in incubation chambers. No other bee houses have that. 
And that's what I was trying to develop all those years. I finally came up with one, and we still don't have one. I've got them, but I don't. I've only have two. I only have my two originals, and and they're, those are not for sale. Um, but um, there's other ways to do it. So these are easy to build. I had built these type before, but I wanted the other. So this is a diamond shape bee house. Um, you know, it takes, it takes me a few minutes to cut it and glue it and nail it and measure it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then you just fill it up with, um, you could either use the tubes and liners or use the reeds. And then I, uh, oh, I should have brought one inside and have to pull this out. Bear with me. So I thought, well, how am I going to make an uh, a, a incubation chamber for these bee cocoons? Now, I had seen somebody else doing this. This is not my design. I just copied it. He was using much larger PVC. But um, so I took a three-quarter inch PVC, went and bought a couple caps, drilled a hole in the end of one. You drop your bees cocoons inside there. Put the cap on it, has a hole in the end, put it inside your bee house. Um, bees hatch out of here. This chamber's too big to nest in. They come back to where they were born and they start nesting in this stuff. Works very well, very efficient, very effective. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. Um, you don't have to buy this stuff from me. If you wanna buy it, you know, look around, there's lots of them out on the market. Uh, you might be shocked at the price of some of this stuff, but um, a lot of people use different methods. I've got two scout projects. Thank you. I've got two scout projects I'm doing this year that because I didn't want to build any houses, um, I got Renneby, uh, Jim Watts company up north. Um, his rental program uh, donated a couple of houses for this scout project. And so we're, I'm gonna use his houses and uh, we're gonna use the reeds and um, for an incubation chamber, I just, um, I'm gonna take a couple um, small boxes, like a little, you can use anything, like a little jello box. Just take the insert out and uh, cut a hole in the end and uh, put your cocoons in there and tape that shut and put it right in the top of your bee house. Bees will hatch out of there, come right back to where they were born and find this different, whatever nesting material you're using and they'll start nesting in it. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. I'm sorry? Um, I just cut it the same size as these. That's 5 sixteenths. That's a 5 sixteenths hole. I mean, you could cut it, you know, half inch if you wanted to. I mean, plenty, plenty big enough. Um, this is just, yeah. I wouldn't probably make it any smaller than that, but 5 sixteenths works fine. That's what they use for nesting. So, Gene, go ahead. Go ahead. So you take them out, you harvest them, and then you put them in the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. And then come what? Spring. Yeah, first of April, middle. Of, I mean, first of March, middle of April. Then you put them in the. Put them back in the back in the bee house with the new nesting material. The bees will hatch at the right. You know, when the, when the outside temperature is usually consistently above 50 degrees in the, uh, during the day, um, um, they'll hatch, and um, and then come back and start nesting in those chambers. Yeah, Jeannie. Yeah, <clears throat> I put bees at Jeannie's place over. She, you guys, most of you probably know her. She's got a beautiful orchard over there. Um, and a couple of years ago, I put, I don't remember if we were putting these with the laminates or what, but I've done a couple of experiments. Now, I don't think the bees care 
if they're these, I don't think they care really. They'll use all of them. But what I have discovered is to never place reeds in the same bee house with laminate. I don't know why. Bees love these things. It's great. They'll use these first before they ever touch that laminate. They're actually a lot harder to get out of there. Is that, I mean, that's the one you just squeeze and it... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they break really easy. It's amazing how easy these things are to open. Um, unlike bamboo that's so hard, you almost have to lay a knife on, on the edge like that and hit it with a hammer to crack it and then twist the knife in order to split it open. Them things are terrible. Um, they also don't breathe very well. These do breathe a little bit. So, um, uh, like I say, they'll, the bees will use all of them. Once <clears throat> I think if you're going to use one or the other, stick with whatever, whatever, with whatever you like, or simply don't mix uh, the stuff um, in the same bee house. Now. Um, I knew you were going to ask me that. I should have, I should have uh, looked that up. It starts with an E. That's all I can tell you. I'm sorry, I don't remember. Um, it is an invasive grass. This is actually harvested in Utah. And I get it shipped here from Utah. So I grow... I'm sorry? Of the, of the grass? Uh, no. Um, I'm going to have to look that up again. I used to know. I just... I probably forgot it because I can't pronounce it. <laughs> but it's just a, it's a hollow stem, kind of like grass, and it actually grows in the water. Is it no, it's not eel grass. It's the name's real long. I'd have to, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I could Google it real quick. Might get lucky. Um, but yeah, they work very well. You know the weird thing. The thing is, is that. And not that I care that the bees use these and then go to that. The problem is, is that at about, probably about the same time, I conducted an experiment at my house. So I had two laminates, and then I had a hundred of these things in between the two laminates. They not only filled these up before going to that, but they weren't happy when these were full. They were still trying to find a way in there. They were even, they were even, there's a small spot in the back. They were even going in the back of that and laying an egg. They wanted these so much. Once they were, um, realized that there was just no more uh, room, they finally started using the laminates. So I don't put them together anymore. But they all work, they all work great. It's just a matter, it's just a difference in price and a difference in um, um, the harvesting of it. You know, I told you real quick, let me do this. I think I... I just want to put a paper liner. I have a black plug on the back, closes the back off. So all you do is remove that black plug Right. The tube is inside there. You can use a 5 sixteenths dowel or you can buy one of these. It just has a little handle on it. I made this um, with a 5 sixteenths dowel and uh, got this little wooden handle <coughs> and um, put it in there, cut it to length, glued it in there. Just stick it in here. Push that out once it's full of bee cocoons and then all your bee, bee cocoons are inside, inside this. So you can store them this way, and or when you're ready to harvest, um, you just extract these and um, unwind these paper straws to get your cocoons out. Um, you can even um, put these in a very lightly warm, not cold, but slightly warm water for a couple of minutes. The glue will let go, and these things just unravel. So they're very, they work very well. Yes, ma'am. So if you don't feel like, like if I don't feel like I have the time or the knowledge to harvest mine, can I just um, put them in my garage and they'll take care of themselves? And then you bring it out in the spring? 
You can. <clears throat> um, again, we encourage people not to do that for one basic reason. You know what I reason? Because when I first started doing this years ago, I used to tell people, harvest if you want, don't harvest if you don't want. The predatory insects have gotten so bad, especially the invasive ones, that we encourage everybody to harvest. If you're not going to harvest, please rent them, because all you're going to do is create this breeding ground for these predatory insects. And what will happen is, is that eventually um, they'll overwhelm your own bees and you won't have any bees because they'll outgrow your bees. So when, when you uh, clean your tubes out, do you see the predatory invasive? I do, yeah. And, then, and you recognize them, and then you kill those? Correct. And keep the good ones? Correct, okay. yeah. Now, the Houdini fly maggots are very easy to see. Um, they're very easy to see in there. <clears throat> the uh, mites are a little bit of a problem being microscopic, it's one reason we can efficiently get rid of 99% of them when we wash. Another thing you do when you, um, inside the nesting chambers, um, if they've overwhelmed a chamber, they'll be there in mass. And you open it up and you look and there's this whole chamber, is full. you think it's pollen, right? Until you touch it and it just falls apart. Why don't you watch that mess for a minute? Yeah, that mess will start moving. And those are mites in there. And if you've never seen a mite under a microscope, have a look. You probably won't look again. They're nasty looking little things. So, <clears throat> um, so there's that. <clears throat> now the Houdini fly we, we find easily. Monos are a lot harder. Um, that's why this stuff is so good they can't penetrate this wood with their oppositors. They have to actually get inside that hole at some point to do their damage. They can't really penetrate these natural reeds with their oppositors too hard as well. And that's why this particular tube, they call it, uh, 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 they call it wet country. It actually has a mylar coating on this cardboard. It helps prevent um, um, moisture, but at the same time, it makes it even harder for that mono to penetrate this chamber and to pot her eggs. People will take, <clears throat> a lot of people try to cut corners, and we'll kind of touch on that for a second. People just use just straws, just the paper straw. They'll fill up their house with a bunch of paper straws. Works great. Monos love it. And they will take advantage of it. And you'll know it <clears throat> because when you go to um, look at your straws or look at your bees, um, that straw will have a hole in it, a tiny little hole. Well, what happened was is that the uh, mono wasp female laid her eggs in there. They, hatch. they can actually go through several generations in a season. Um, generally, they don't hatch till about the time the mason bees are done. So once your bees are done, if you protect them from that invasion, you can help eliminate a lot of that. I'll tell you how to do that in a second. <clears throat> but, so you see that hole in there, so she deposited her eggs in there, eggs hatched, the monos killed everything, the little mono wasp, and um, if you see them in a the chamber, there's a lot of them. Um, they crawled through that little tiny hole, made it a little bigger as they escaped, and they flew away and probably came back and infected your house even more. Um, so that's one way to tell. Another way we find them is candling them. If they get infected early or late enough um, and they end up being refrigerated, you kind of slow their emergence. You've put, you put the monos into hibernation. We find them in candling. And um, you can actually see them in the light when you candle, and you'll see all these monos in there. And they get the, they get the Rick method. <laughs> so, um, and I've got, you see all those videos and stuff, 
Um, those videos, most of those videos are on my uh, Facebook page, and it's all the buzz. <clears throat> um, now, if you want, I'll try to show you a picture real quick. Hang on. Bam, just like that, I got two. We'll try to, I'll try to show you, <clears throat> you may not be able to see it real well. Oh, you can't, bear with me. You can't, you can't hear that, can you? Or could you? Could you hear that? No, because it's in my hearing aids. <laughs> so, um, so unfortunately, you can't hear it. So I'll kind of, uh, um, I'll kind of talk through this. That is my individual light. Can you see that B inside there? You can see the B's head at the nipple end, and its abdomen at the other end. Okay. So. I just did that for the video purposes. Um, I don't know if you noticed when you looked at those bee cocoons, the cocoons have a nipple at one end. That's where the head of the bee is. Um, the other end, the round end, is the abdomen end. I'll show you another one real quick, um, just because I have it here. I guess I could show you a couple of these videos if you want. These are monos. It's a little harder to see. You see the monos inside of that cocoon? See those little dots inside there? It's kind of hard to see it. Doesn't look anything like a bee, does it? You see those back there? Probably not, yeah. Now I'll come back and I'll show you real quick. You see that? Yeah. Doesn't look like a bee. But you see those little mono wasp larvae inside there? Yeah. So, anyway. It's kind of hard to... Sorry, that's, yeah, kind of hard to see that on my phone, and I guess one of these days maybe I'll put a PowerPoint together. It's just I've never done this. First time I've actually showed people pictures, too, so. <laughs> but a uh, ton of that stuff on my pages if you want to see all that stuff. So it's some good information stuff. Doing it on size and by location in the chamber. Yeah. When you set up the bees for the orchard, how many do you put per hour? Um, this orchard right here, um, I have to think about it real quick. Um, let's see. Just, uh, just about, not quite, right at about a thousand. And those bees travel to our garden? Yeah, well? to the garden, possibly. These bees will only travel the length of a football field in every direction in search of food. If they don't find food in that fly range, they leave. And they won't come back. No. No, no, not even that. Um, Ten's not really enough. I always recommend people start with 30. You know, it gives you a good shot. I mean, because at 30, even at 30 bees, you only have uh, 12 females. Okay? Um, so um, you could start with 10, you could start with 20. I always recommend 30. Gives you a good shot 
at being productive your first year um, with with your with your bees. Um, and so I'd like 30 in that bee house right there would work perfect with the 50 reeds. Um, be perfect for that. Yeah, now these bees will take advantage of that because they're within the fly range. So um, that's great. So, you know, you know, in the wild, I kind of touched on this a little while ago. In the wild, <clears throat> these bees don't have access to all these fruit trees, right? Um, but they are naturally adapted to feed on any early flowering um, spring plant. Um, they won't do anything for your summer plants. That's another bee, if I could tell you about that in a second, but <clears throat> these are spring pollinators. One reason they're so efficient is that they come out so early. <clears throat> And in the wild, like I said, they'll feed on whatever they can find um, that's generally wild, right, in the wild. Um, but these fruit trees are so prolific in their blooming that they're naturally attracted to them and um, will fly right to them. So, but with the orchard right here, I mean your, your garden right here, yeah, because we got, yeah, I'm sure they're inside that fly range but they're only spring pollinators. So if it's not blooming in the spring, you're not gonna do anything for you in the summer. I mean, <clears throat> you got summer plants, they even have a bee, I can't think of the name of it, um, off the top of my head right now. Um, it's a mason bee they use for pollinating like squashes, squash and pumpkins, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> but I think uh, the leaf cutter bee um, would do, probably do that just as well. Um, and that's a summer pollinating bee. Um, it seemed like the most abundant bee that was in our garden last year was the bumblebee. Yeah, well, you know, bumble. Yeah. Yeah, but the bumblebees are generally later, okay. right? All your spring flowers and, and plants and trees, bumblebees are usually not going to be available for those. Um, you'll see them soon, the big queens. You'll get a queen, a queen bumblebee, I don't know how many or, or whatever the ratio is, but a certain amount of them will hibernate. You know, hibernate in the leaves or whatever it is. And they're, they're huge when you see them. They'll start, they'll be coming out pretty soon and they're coming out and they're slow. Big old, big old <laughs> things. And they're lumbering around, you see them, they're generally flying close to the ground. <clears throat> they're looking for a place to nest. And then she'll lay her eggs, and then the eggs will hatch, and then the offspring, you know, blah, blah, blah. But usually you don't see them until later, after all that spring stuff is done. They're great summer pollinators. Right. So. So are the leaf cutter ones the ones you'd recommend? <clears throat> now, in the summer, um, I think generally in the summer, um, you know, with the bumblebees and the available honeybees in the area, um, grown or there are some that have gone wild and have wild hives. Um, they're still not native, but they're wild. Um, and other beneficial pollinating insects during the summer. Generally, we don't have a pollination problem with our summer stuff. Now, if you feel you're not getting the crops on your summer uh, plants that you'd like, then there are beneficial bees that you could purchase for that purpose. We have, naturally, a lot of leaf cutters around here as well. So, um, 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 but generally, I think during the summer, I don't think we have a real um, problem with pollination. It's that early spring that we lack the adequate pollinators for those early spring crops is why these bees are so beneficial. Um, some honeybees are out, but you can't really depend on honeybees for pollinating. I mean, you could put a honeybee hive in this orchard, and if you had time to watch, I mean, they'll probably crawl out of there and fly, and you'll see them fly right over the orchard and go away somewhere. It's like, you know, because they're going to feed where they want to feed. These bees won't do that, because they're only going to fly so far. They'll take advantage of it if it's there. 
there's no food there, they'll leave. That's why it's always important also that if you're raising these bees, <clears throat> um, to make sure you have something early spring flowering for them. So if they hatch a little early before the trees or berries that you're trying to pollinate bloom, you wanna make sure they've got something close by to eat to keep them there. So um, anything early you can plant, flowering current, maples, uh, you know, whatever, um, um, Daphne's, uh, japonicas, any of that kind of stuff, have that early flowering plant, um, beneficial. <clears throat> and I'll tell you too that people like Jenny, Jeannie's place over here, um, Jeannie's place usually does very well for bee production. For one reason primarily is the fact that she has a wide variety of fruit there, you know, with plums and apples and pears and cherries. They all, they don't bloom at the same time. So, you know, you got your plums that come in first, you got your cherries and then your apples and so on and so on. So any place that has a, um, that's not a monoculture like here at this orchard where you have one culture of plant, basically, um, any, any orchard where you have multiple varieties of, of fruit blossoming during that spring period, you'll do much better on your production of bees. So we should put some maybe early bloomers around. <coughs> um, you could, um, wouldn't hurt. I don't know exactly what you got blooming over here in your garden, um, but one of the things is, is timing on the orchard here. Um, the bees, a lot of times, you know, stars align, sometimes they don't. Um, so long, you know, you got clover, dandelion, anything, any weed stuff that's growing on, the bees will take advantage of that as well. Um, but um, I gotta tell you, I've been, I don't even know how many years I've been putting bees in this orchard. It's been several now. And last year, last year was probably the best year I've ever had here. I don't know what it was. Um, timing was just right or whatever, but there's been many years I've put bees in here and not got my return on what I put in here. So if I put a thousand, I only harvested 600. That's not good, right? So that's why I use a, a, a variety. I got about 30 places I place bees. Um, I have a number of small orchards like this one. <clears throat> and, um, so if some if one doesn't do very well, I keep my fingers crossed that this one over here will do better. It kind of balances out. Yes, sir. Do, do vineyards benefit from pollination? <clears throat> Grapes are one of those plants that do not require pollination. Amazingly enough, yeah. So I don't know. I don't know what it is, but don't need them. You know, when I first started doing this. Um, Carol touched on it briefly. Um, I, I love cherries, a lot of us do. I bought a small cherry tree. Gardening has always been a hobby of mine, horticulture, horticulture in general. Um, so I bought this cherry tree, it was self-fertile. Um, but when it was little, I knew that it still needed pollen transfer flower to flower in order to produce fruit. So I pollinated it with a feather duster. Worked very well. Uh, cherry tree, I can't reach it anymore to pollinate with a feather duster. So as it got bigger, it didn't work. And I happened to be in a nursery in Pallet. A friend of mine owned it at the time. That nursery's closed down now, but um, I was talking to him about it, and he said, have you ever heard of these bees? I said, no. And he said, yeah. He said, I, I've got a couple of them, a couple of boxes of them, if you want to try some. So I bought a couple of boxes. I don't know, I had a dozen or 20 or whatever it was. and. Through trial and error over a number of years, I grew more and more and more and more and more. Um, now I'm at 150, we produced 150,000 last year, which is my highest ever number. <clears throat> Normally I average about, uh, about 100,000. And then um, we provide bees to uh, uh, some, a couple farms in Northern California to help with their um, uh, almond production. Um, got several blueberry fields that we put bees on to help them 
with their blueberry production and some apples and, and some other stuff. So um, that's what I do. A little. You know, they naturally need to feed after coming out of hibernation and being in hibernation for so long. They need nourishment. So when they hatch, they will fly, fly out and find um, some kind of flower somewhere close and uh, feed on the nectar uh, and then come back to the bee house. They don't spend a lot of time feeding. They'll feed enough uh, for their own nourishment, um, and then they're right back at the bee house waiting for the females. But yeah, they, so they do a little, but not much. And then after breeding, they only live for a few weeks, couple, excuse me, two or three weeks, and they're done, they die. And the females do all the work. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, that's kind of it. Oh, you want to show some <clears throat> um, is that my website or my Facebook page? It looks like my Facebook. Oh, that's my website. Oh, that's the blog. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, now, you probably won't be able to see this, but if you can, you can see that was actually whoops, four hundred. There, I put. No, there's 200, my mistake. I got two laminates. That's my bee house in my backyard on my garage. Um, and this was an experiment I used with the reeds and the laminates. Um, we can show it on a big screen if there's any interest people. Well, I mean, if you guys really, yeah, if you really want to watch it now, yeah, if you want, I suppose we could. That's great. You can see the bees flying in and out of there. But they're really only going to the reeds. They're pretty much ignoring the laminates. So, yeah, in that particular video, um, like I say, you can see the bees flying around there and um, yeah, that noise in the background You'll hear me mention it too. The noise in the background is from my venturi on my waterfall going to my pond. So I made a venturi for that. If anybody's curious about what a venturi is, it's a, it's a way to draw in air as the water comes in. It draws in air and injects the air into the water, creating more oxygen for the pond. So, yeah, come on over. Yeah, one of these days I should put a PowerPoint together like this for folks. What are you doing next Saturday? I got a talk at the library and university place. <laughs> you know, I've, I've had people tell me, you know, oh, you should do one of these, and but most people say, no, 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 it takes up too much time. So I don't know. Yeah, nice to see pictures. <coughs> I didn't even know I had that on my blog. I'm surprised. I thought that was on my Facebook page. Oh, well, yeah, there's... Yeah, these are my harvest videos. Yeah, you're on the on the website, all right. Oh, it's showing up there? Oh, I can go figure. Oh. There you go. You ready? Hard 
They've already filled up almost every one of them. And you got a couple females starting to go to the laminates now, but there's not one laminate nesting chamber that's plugged off with mud. And if you looked at real close at those reeds, about 75% or more are already full. So. No, it's just that they prefer the reeds. So if you put them together, they'll always use the reeds first. Now, if you take those reeds away, they'll go right in those laminates because laminates are primarily what I use. So. No, no, the wood, the wood's reasonably smooth too. The, 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 uh, the reeds probably got more junk in it than the wood does. So maybe it's more natural for them. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but yeah, they love those things. Now you can see at the top right, <clears throat> rubber band's kind of blocking part of it, but um, a bunch of years ago I wanted something to put on my production houses. This is just a production house. This is just a way to grow, re grow bees, nothing fancy. Um, but I went to the dollar store and I found these little sandwich boxes, these little plastic sandwich containers. They were selling them three for a buck, so I wish I'd have bought twice as many as I did. But um, So I brought them home. Now those are half inch holes, which are way bigger than you need. Um, but I brought them home and during the summer I painted them black and then I drilled that half inch hole in it. And so I put all the bees inside of that, same thing I do here at this orchard. And uh, the bees hatch in there and then they fly out and they come back to where they're born. And these nesting chambers are just the right size for the bees to use and they naturally use them. I'm sorry? I sprayed those little plastic containers black. Now, um, I did it in the summer um, and I used a low VOC for what that's worth. Um, and then all summer long and all winter, I, that way it took, I didn't spray it and then put the bees in it, right? I sprayed them, prepped them for the next year. So it, for 10 months, I had 10 months for that smell to go away. Right, so um, um, so that worked very well. Um, now you can see all that white stuff. Some of that might be the plastic just be getting old, but all those white spots on the front of that bee house and on that plastic, almost all of that are from the bees. Uh, because uh, coming out of hibernation, as soon as they crawl out of there, I'm short of mating, they only have one thing on their mind and that is relieving themselves. <laughs> so, and that's what all of that is. But, <clears throat> you know, it's funny, you know, people, people will call me, I think I mentioned, I don't know if I mentioned that or not, they'll call me and ask me two things. They'll say, well, I don't understand, what's going on, my bees are, you know, and they're not hatching, they're not hatching. I tell everybody the same thing, be patient. <laughs> Those bees will hatch when they're ready to hatch. <clears throat> and the other thing is people say, well, I don't understand why the bees are going back in that nesting box, or I mean in that release container. I just call it a release container because I incubation container, whatever. Um, why are the bees going in there? Well, the females aren't going in there, I'll tell you that. The males are going in there. Why are they going in there? They're going in there trying to get them females to wake up. They're in there pushing them female cocoons around it's like, come on, girls, let's get with the program. <laughs> so that's what that's all about. And, you know, I take those uh, containers at the end of the season, and uh, I take them home, and I actually, oh, we didn't talk about that. <clears throat> um, so I protect all that stuff during the summer. I don't leave that stuff in the orchard. You can. There's a way to do that as well. But um, So I take it home and protect it at home. But then those plastic containers, eventually I'll take all those and I will open every one of them and look in every one of those and look at my hatch ratio. And I might put, let's see what, I probably put 400 bees in, at that location right there. With uh, See, I got, well, each laminate's about 100 holes and each one of those bundles is 50. So 
you got uh, you got 400 nesting chambers, so I probably have about 400 bees there, um, which is really more than I need. But um, um, I don't mind putting a few more bees on location at a bee house. So what if a few fly away and go wild? You know, they're native bees anyway, and just repopulating our native uh, bee, bee environment, so it's all good. Um, but one, so I, I look in that nesting box and, and, and check my hatch ratio, um, and generally, in something like that, it's got 400 bees in there, I might find two that didn't hatch. So I'm pretty happy with that. Um, there's a couple things you can do. If you want to leave them in place, you can do that. You can do one of two things. You can buy an organza bag, just a fine mesh bag, right? See right through it, breeze real well. These I purchased, I hate to admit, but they come from China. This is the only thing I use that's from China. I can't find these made in the United States. I refuse to use any of this other stuff made in China. I won't do it. There are people in the industry that sell this stuff to you, made in China. Don't go to Amazon and buy these products. You can, I encourage you not to, they're a lot less expensive, but you don't know how they're made or what they're made of. Okay? So, this is made in Oregon. This, I made at my house. I have natural uh, cedar. Um, these come from Utah, and these are made in Michigan. I know where they're all made. So, um, um, but anyway, so, now you can take something like this, and you could actually put over the front of your bee house. Or you can do what I do, is actually remove the laminates or the reeds or whatever. I bring them home and I actually put them inside here. I put four of these and one of these and I zip it shut. Now I actually take a water bottle. I got a whole bunch of them at home. Um, that um, I cut the ends off. So I cut this off and I cut that off, just make it a round cylinder. And I take an insect strip. Uh, that you can buy, and I cut them into sections. I put an insect strip, I kind of concave it and put it inside there, and I put it right on top of the laminates, like that. Put one inside each one of those, and that way I can trap any insects that are hiding in here when I zip them closed inside that bag. So they can't escape at my house, and as they crawl around during the day or at night or whatever, Eventually, they'll crawl in there and I get them. <clears throat> it also helps identify um, what kind of predatory insects you might be dealing with at a specific location. So, yeah. Yeah, kind of similar to that, yeah. The, out here in the orchard, you'll probably see them. They've been out there for a couple of years. I keep using them. Um, I wrapped them in black tape to make them dark um, and just left a hole at the end for the airwigs going out. Airwigs like a dark environment, right? That's why a lot of people use rolled up uh, newspapers and stuff like that. You heard that old trick and they throw it out in their garden and the airwigs will hide in there and nest in there because they want to find somewhere where it's real dark to live and nest. They'll crawl out and go feed and then they'll go in these little dark spots to to nest and, and hide during the day or whatever. <clears throat> so I took some water bottles, wrapped it in black tape to make it dark. And then every spring when I come out, um, I tip them up and I pour in a little um, Sluggo Plus. Sluggo, the chemical, they're pellets, okay? Um, Sluggo is great for slugs. Uh, but will not kill earwigs. Sluggo Plus will kill earwigs. Okay? Um, finding something to kill earwigs is, uh, there's not a lot of stuff out there. Sluggo Plus is one of those that works very well. So I'll put a half a, oh, not even a half a cup, probably less than a quarter of a cup or whatever. You know, a couple tablespoons of Sluggo Plus inside here underneath the bee house, and it's just to help control 
the earwig problem in this orchard. And I put them underneath every post going up to the house. If I don't, I couldn't put bees here. I just couldn't do it. Because they will wipe those houses out. I was shocked the first time. I, uh, after I put bees in here, that first time I came back and picked them up. It was terrible. And I stopped for one year, or one year, I think I stopped one year and then came back. And that, that year wasn't too bad, but the next year was. So they repopulated. I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, I put the sluggo plus in here. So as the earwigs um, crawl, you know, crawl across the ground and crawl up to the post to crawl up the post, um, while they may get up, some may get there, some may see this cute little dark spot with a, a neat, neat place to go hide, and they crawl in there and there's food in there, they consume it and it kills them. Yeah, so does it get them all? No, but it's been helping control the problem in this orchard. You. Yeah, you're welcome. On your website, do you have sources to get the supplies that you use? No. Um, if people um, want any of this stuff, um, there's several websites out there that you can go buy this stuff. Um, I keep, generally, I keep enough for people, if they want something, I have it for them. So I keep a certain amount. I don't do, I'll tell you, I, I dabbled in the retail industry a little bit. <laughs> Took up way too much of my time. I don't do it anymore. Um, there are other companies out there, be happy to sell you this stuff. Um, but I usually keep enough to make some available. If I run out, I'd be more than happy. Or you can go out and find it yourself. Um, uh, Jim Watts program over there at Renneby, they don't sell anything. They're a strictly a rental um, lease program. Um, Knox Sellers in Bremerton will sell you bees and supplies. Uh, Mason Bee for Sales in Utah will sell you stuff. I won't even recommend one in Washington State because I don't like the guy. So I won't even mention his name. Um, but um, I actually saw him in a video uh, yesterday um, um, talking about bees and Orchard Mason Bee Society, the national conference thing. They were all talking about mason bees. And one of the things they were talking about is a mason bee called corner fronds and a mason bee called taurus. Corner fronds are from Japan a lot of them in the United States brought here, Ugh. you know, and uh, use them on the East Coast primarily. They have invaded the West Coast a little bit. I look for them when I harvest. I probably sacrifice at least a couple dozen mason bees every year in an attempt to find any potential corner fronds and kill them when I find them. I don't use them. I don't want them. They're not native. I don't want them here. Um, people people in the industry have no problem with it. I'm just not one of them. Um, and the other is Taurus. Taurus is from, um, no, corn from from Japan. Taurus is from China. So what's the species name for the bees that are native here? Uh, Blue Orchard Mason. Blue Orchard Mason. Mm-hmm. Okay, Jerry. We'll talk soon. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> that's kind of it. Unless you guys have any more questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, I've got bees for sale if anybody wants some. I've got a couple of these houses I brought, uh, kind of starter houses that are available for sale if somebody wants them. Um, if not, there's, like I said, there's people out there to sell you this stuff. Um, I've got some reeds and tubes and liners, laminates uh, for sale if you want some. I'll tell you what, it's just like these things. I have 250 of these things I use. When I first started buying these things, these things were $50 each. They were spendy. They've come down in price a little bit. Um, you can go to some of your nurseries around um, and buy these 
I saw one in a nursery. It wasn't last year. I was at home in a cast, <coughs> but um, you might know, have an apprentice that's been working with me. It's been helping me a lot. She couldn't make it today, but um, I, I saw these. I saw one of these in a nursery two years ago. It went eighty dollars for this thing. It's in. Oh, they do it. Machine does it. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah. But these are all made in Oregon. I mean, I, don't, I you know, I don't knock anybody for wanting to make a profit, but they're spending. So I always, I always buy like a dozen extra every year and make them available for a little less money, um, so people don't have to pay those high prices. Same with these. These are reasonable, but I can sell them for the same price at a smaller quantity than the than the distributor. And the same with the reeds. So, and the same with the bees. The bees I sell, um, I sell for the same price I bought them for over 15 years ago. So I have not, I have not changed that. Um, now I told you I raised 150,000. You think that's a lot? You might think I'm a millionaire when I tell you this. I'm not because I give so many of these things away <clears throat> um, to these orchards and these uh, scout projects and stuff. These bees sell for a dollar a piece. That's what I paid for them 15 years ago. You can find them today, and they go from anywhere from a buck and a half to two dollars a piece. So, you know, I'm lucky if I, to be perfectly honest with you, I'm lucky if I sell you a thousand, sell a thousand a year, so. Um, but that's not what I do this for, so. But I do like to have them for people that want some. They don't have to pay shipping and, you know, yada, yada. And you know, when you buy them from me, you know what you're getting, right? So, that's it. Anything else? <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me out. Uh, enjoyed uh, sharing my information with all of you. If you have any questions, you can go to It's All A Buzz on Facebook, It's All A Buzz, uh, com. Send me a message. I'll be back out. Um, probably in about a month uh, to bring bees to the island. So 